Hey, this is Blonde Guy Gamer, and welcome to Black Sheep Game Reviews. As you can see from the title of the video and the games on my show, that the winner of the next Black Sheep Game Review is Soul Calibur Legends. Goody. So, Soul Calibur. I wouldn't have the games up here if it wasn't a good series. Soul Calibur Legends, on the other hand... Well, let's talk about Soul Calibur as a whole first. Soul Calibur is an arcade-style 3D fighting game series from Namco that focuses on weapon-based combat and is pretty popular among fighting game enthusiasts. It first started out with Soul Edge, or Blade as it's called outside of Japan, in arcades and on the PlayStation. While the first Soul Calibur most people know on the Dreamcast is actually the sequel, and the series continued to gain momentum and popularity with Soul Calibur 2 on all three major consoles at the time. This is actually the first Soul Calibur I played because, like a lot of people, I got the GameCube version because Link from Legend of Zelda is in that one. As of this review, I don't have Broken Destiny or even the very first game for that matter, but I do have the other games. I may not play a lot of fighting games, and not that well to be frank, but I still enjoy the Soul Calibur games. With its fluid controls, fighting mechanics, variety of characters and their weapons from a fictional 16th century setting, and being able to create your own custom characters to fight as in Soul Calibur 3 and onward. They're among some of my favorite 3D fighting games, even if 5 story and new characters are a little... suspect. However, in between Soul Calibur 3 and 4, a spin-off game was made for the Wii and released in 2007, Soul Calibur Legends. What makes this game completely different from the rest is that it's not a traditional fighting game, but an action-adventure hack-and-slash. Heh, <laughs> what's next, a game from an action-adventure series made into a fighting game for the Wii- oh, right. While it may seem like an odd choice to make a Soul Calibur game like this, it's actually not too bad of an idea as all the games before and after Legends have aspects of a single-player campaign besides the standard arcade mode. I know some of you may scoff at stories in most fighting games, but I actually do care and invest into the characters and story of Soul Calibur. Why else would I make a remark about 5 in that regard? I was at least curious to see where Legends went in terms of a more fleshed out adventure in this setting compared to the somewhat simplistic narratives the games had before. It sounds promising enough, but you'll soon discover what happens when the series developer Project Soul experiments with something else after only making fighting games with their franchise before. A lot of you voted for this one first, so here it is. Soul Calibur Legends starts out with an intro movie, which is pretty standard for the series, except here it's animated, or rather, sort of animated, like a visual comic. Not to mention being short, which, if you know the other games, are known for their extensive intro movies, so this is already saying something. Hell, my copy of Soul Calibur 2 has a disc reissue halfway through the intro, and that still lasted longer than the one in Legends. And when you begin a new single-player game, the intro movie plays out again as a cutscene, meaning the one before the title screen is basically just an edited version. Get used to the game reusing things, by the way. The intro explains the series' source Soul Edge and Caliber, and how one is evil and powerful, while the other is not so evil and can destroy the other respectively. The game takes place in between the Soul Edge and Soul Calibur games, in which two empires and series character Siegfried seek power from said trademark swords. Which Siegfried does at the beginning of the game by finding Soul Edge on board a pirate ship. And we already have an inconsistency. You see, the actual story is that Siegfried found the corpse of Cervantes, the series' badass undead pirate, who had Soul Edge but briefly came back to life when Siegfried fought him, then took Soul Edge and became the series' antagonist, Nightmare. In Legends, you do still fight Cervantes, but not before getting Soul Edge and not becoming Nightmare right away. However, I do know that this game is considered non-canon, so these details don't change anything in the long run. So a game that takes place in between two funny games isn't canon, yet a Castlevania funny game that brings characters through a time rift is still somehow canon for that series. Yeah, that makes sense. Although you could interpret Legends as more of a what-if kind of story, but it still feels like they made it non-canon as an excuse for the inconsistencies and retcons. After dealing with a few skeletons in our retcon fight with Cervante, Soul Edge releases a burst of energy known as the Evil Seed and releases monsters, which the game calls Evils. Yeah, real creative there, Project Soul. After a bizarrely long six months later, Siegfried is brought to the Masked Emperor of the Roman Empire and is asked to use Soul Edge against Barbaros, the leader of the Ottoman Empire, who used Soul Calibur to become a giant and is trying to take over the Roman Empire. Wait, didn't the intro just say that Soul Calibur's only purpose is to defeat Soul Edge? Created solely to destroy Soul Edge. So, he somehow used the power of Soul Calibur to become a God of War boss? Sure, whatever. In order to restore Soul Edge's full power to stop Barbaros, Siegfried needs to find fragments for the sword and is given two months to complete the task, which is how long the Emperor plans to hold Barbaros back. Um, he's right there, you know. It doesn't look like you'll be able to hold him back for two hours, let alone two months unless you plan on pelting him with fire catapults for that long. Siegfried is also accompanied with Iska, the court jester doesn't really act or look like one, and is the informant telling you where you need to go which are stages on a world map similar to the other single-player Soul Calibur modes. 
And like those, you need to use the analog stick or D-pad to move the cursor around and select the stages. Personally, I don't see anything wrong with having to move a cursor in a Wii game with the analog stick. It's not like you just point at the screen to move the cursor around. Whoever heard of Wii games doing that? <laughs> Let's just ignore that odd design choice and explain how gameplay works. You do horizontal, vertical, thrust, and uppercut attacks with the appropriate motion with the Wiimote. The only problem with these is that they are pretty imprecise, as sometimes you'll do an attack you didn't want to, which happens most often between vertical and uppercut attacks. There are options to change the motion sensitivity and what you want attack motions to lean more towards, but I left those at default was still able to play through the game relatively okay despite some iffy swing detection. It does at least make half decent use of the Wii motion controls and isn't just waggling. You can also move the nunchuck in a direction to evade, although it's not as helpful as you want it to be, and you can also shake it while blocking with Z to do a guard impact to deflect projectiles and attacks to stun enemies. There's also jumping with the B button, which has a delay and is awkward, and targeting with different enemies with the A button. The lock-on system isn't that good though, as it just targets the first enemy and pressing A cycles through present enemies one by one. By holding A you can break out of lock-on, which you may have to so you can run over to certain enemies and obstacles first. But attacking without locking on is a detriment, so locking back on with A again is recommended. The C button is used for activating Spirit Charge, which are powerful attacks you can perform with each motion that uses up a gauge. And that's about it for the controls. It's not what I would call bad, but lacking, as the D-pad is not used at all during missions. The latter is definitely true since you have little control over it with the exception of pressing Z to bring it behind you, but it's at its worst when up against a wall or in a corner. Along the adventure, Siegfried is joined by other characters, whom can help in battles as a partner. If one of the main fan service characters, Ivy, on the cover isn't any indication. Also, one of the mummies in the background there seems to be enjoying said fan service. Some titty mm bop bop titties. <laughs> Besides Mbop Titties, I mean Ivy, there actually isn't that many other characters to play as. There's Mitsurugi, Sophidia, Pointy McNinja Boobs, I mean Taki, the prototype Astaroth, and Lloyd from Tales of Symphonia. Because why not? Although this is not a fighting game, it has the least amount of series characters out of all the Soul games. And that's including two people that are only bosses. Even characters that are prominent since the very first Soul game are not here. Granted, you can only pick two at a time for most missions, but can switch between them on the fly, which is helpful when one is low on health and you can switch to the other until you can find some healing items. Each character does have their own fighting style, but it's still more or less the same hack and slash combat. Although with faster characters, it's much easier to attack relentlessly and build up combos because of them. Much of the game relies on finding the same few enemy types to proceed to the next area, which is to be expected, but the game does attempt interactive environments, keyword being attempt. All you have to do to move on in some areas is simply swing your sword at something. Legend of Zelda, this is not. There's also limited destructible objects that can fall on you or destroy yourself, the majority of which are pots that can have its physics bug out now and then that give you health recovery, spirit charge, and weapon skill increases. The last of which does help level up your weapons, but I didn't see any noticeable improvements or anything while fighting. So the changes, if any, are neglectable to me. Same with acquiring new weapons, as you only get a few for each character, and besides the look, don't seem any different. Which is puzzling since the games before had extensive weapon selection for each character you can unlock. Here they don't tell you what makes them different, and leveling them up through fighting and collecting power-ups don't seem to make a noticeable impact either. It makes collecting and leveling up weapons feel pointless and not rewarding. It gets even better when the only purpose of the game's ranking system is getting a new weapon every few ranks you level up after completing stages. That's it. You would think they would have something like being able to earn gold and buy new weapons, but no. There's very few rewards to warrant this obligatory rank system. Not to mention each character gets a third weapon near the end of the game anyway that still don't seem all that different than the ones they started out with. Because of this, the fighting gets repetitive quickly and it's not that satisfying. It also doesn't help that there are only 9 locations and you'll revisit them at least 2, 3, sometimes even upwards of 4 or 5 times throughout the entire campaign. The game tries to change the layout and objectives every time, but it still doesn't alter the fact you'll be doing the same things over, and over, and over again. They cut a lot of corners with this game and it sucked nearly all the fun out of me. What also makes the levels not very fun is that most are full of traps and obstacles in between rooms of enemies. These are usually mildly annoying and don't do too much damage, except for one, boulders. Literal giant rock boulders that roll towards you and take off about a third of your health with each hit. Now, boulders on a mountain or in a temple, fine. But when they show up inside mansions, you've gone way too overboard with them. These goddamn boulders are everywhere and it's easy to lose a character to them, especially if you're in a bad camera angle and don't see them coming. With all these boulders rolling down hills and stairways, it feels more like a video game version of Boulder Dash and MXC rather than a Soul Calibur game at times. Uh -oh. And decides to turn and run, uh -oh. interesting strategy! Uh -oh. Ow! Ah! Man, he's sandwiched! You can still avoid and even attack boulders to break them before they hit you, but these are still a major pain in the ass. 
The story doesn't fare much better. It isn't terrible even for funny game spin-off standards, but it's not all that compelling. Basically, it boils down to a plot twist at the end, but before that we have Siegfried finding and recruiting other characters who are also looking for Soul Edge, but are in mutual agreement to not fight over it and take care of Barbaros first. Dialogue between all the characters is just done with character portraits and text boxes on the world map, with only a scant few animated and in-game cutscenes. Although you could argue it's still better presented than 5 story mode. The rest of the graphics are... Eh. I mean, the character models aren't bad for older Soul Calibur game standards, but most designs seem to be reused from Soul Calibur 2 or 3, which is odd since the game takes place before those. The stages are pretty bland looking and not all that interesting. I know this is an early Wii game, but they could have done a lot more if they were just going to reuse areas and even animations from previous games. It's not that good looking of a game, which is disappointing considering the series is known for its well done presentation. Hell, I think the first Soul Calibur on Dreamcast looked better in some aspects. The sound design does at least have appropriate sound effects and orchestrated music, even if played quite often because of the locations you'll constantly visit. The Wiimote speaker is also utilized, but only for one stock swing sound effect when attacking that plays even when you hold the block and swing the controller. Voice acting, while there's not much in the game, is okay too for the most part. Although in some stages late in the game, characters about an exposition like to make pauses longer than William Shatner. If Soul Edge is separated from Siegfried, yeah, Soul will try to claim it. There is also a part in every chapter where you need to head back to the castle battlegrounds to defeat all enemies with a time limit, which gets old really fast. And you constantly hear the shouting of three castle guard soldiers, but never actually see them in battle. All the yelling about there's too many or we can do it sort of makes this like a Dynasty Warrior game if it wasn't as crazy. Or fun. Speaking of voices, fun fact, Yuri Lowenthal is Michael, the pompous looking knight captain guy. Hey wait, he reminds me of... At last! You understand how weak you are! And Yuri Lowenthal voiced him too! I guess he's good with douchebag characters. While the game doesn't list the English voice actors in the credits, like Castlevania Judgment, there are still a few other noteworthy things from what I was able to find, like Lloyd's voice actor not being the original Tales of Symphonia, but was Lloyd in Tales of the Radiant World mythology. Just throwing it out there as a Tales fan. Most of the other main characters do have the same voice actors from other Soul Calibur games before and or after this game, such as Siegfried's voice actor reprising his role in 4, but get this, it's the same voice actor who does Ezio, Sonic the Hedgehog, and Chris Redfield lately. Which is kind of funny when he voiced Ezio but not Siegfried in Soul Calibur 5. Also, do you think Siegfried would be better suited to deal with boulders considering how Chris deals with them in Resident Evil 5? Another I want to mention is Ivy's voice actress, who also voiced her in Soul Calibur 3 and Onwards, but lays the accent a little thick here. I will eliminate the blood of the evil sword. Help me out for a little while longer. I need a weapon to destroy the evil sword. Seems like the voice actress is leaning more towards Adria the Witch from the first Diablo, whom she also voiced. I sense a soul in search of answers. Also another fun fact, same voice actress that did Bubsy in Bubsy 3D. Meanwhile, back with our meandering plot, Siegfried gets pieces of Soul Edge from Guardians, which are the bosses of the game, to regain the sword's full power. Though even getting to those require beating other stages for plot relevant progression things, but it doesn't matter what order you do them and there's a few other characters you won't care about that much that are just there to move the game along. In fact, the only new person given full development and backstory is Iska, whom you can also select on the world map in each chapter for sets of additional conversations. You'll quickly discover that he goes on about certain things that the game will force you to not forget. Let's just say if you were to start a drinking game every time you mention his sister that he lost, you'll be out cold by the fourth chapter. And if you want the death by alcohol poisoning option, take a shot every time he mentions his sister, his conquered home country, and the food he misses. Dude, we freaking get it. Shut up! Honestly, the only thing about the story and characters that I cared a little bit was Lloyd's inclusion, as silly as it sounds. If only because Tales of Symphonia is one of my favorite JRPGs. That only goes so far as, while it is pretty customary to have guest characters in the Soul Calibur games and Tales is a Namco series too, it's still odd to include a character from that here. Because Lloyd is from a game with an anime style and Soul Calibur tends to be more realistic looking, Lloyd looks... Ah! Uncanny Valley! Yeah, he looks weird in this game. At least you don't see his character model face too much even when you play as him, and his dialogue portrait isn't bad either. Still, it feels like he was just shoved in here just for the sake of a guest character. The game does attempt to tie in why Lloyd is in the Soul Calibur world, which will at least make a little sense if you know Tales of Symphonia. He still feels out of place with the story though regardless. Oh, and the surprise of him being in the game is diminished right away in the main menu as he's right there in the multiplayer section, which we'll get to after I'm done talking about the single player. Let's just summarize the rest of the story quickly. Okay, so Soul Edge gets fully restored, everyone is still wary about it, but we still need to kill Barbaros, and we do. Soul Calibur is now the Masked Emperor, who is actually a woman because... 
she just is and constantly reminds Iska of his sister, shut up already! But then another plot twist comes in and that the Emperor wants to conquer the world to protect it, because that logic is always flawless. However, Soul Edge and Caliber have a reaction that emits another evil sea that plunges the world into darker chaos. Or rather, they just added a color filter and floating ball spirits to make it seem like it is. Oh man, the world is slightly tinted purple! Truly, this is the sign of the apocalypse! So we're then getting helpful information from Paracelsus, yes, the 16th century alchemist who looks like Seymour from Final Fantasy X with a haircut in this game, which is somehow even more ridiculous than the implied Leonardo da Vinci character who also helps out. Wouldn't be a game in this time period without historic liberties, even though both will be dead by the time the Soul Games take place. Anyway, Paracelsus explains that the evils can come from both swords and that they're actually people transformed by the sword's power, which means the true evil is people wanting power, how subtle. Also, earlier in the game when we met him, we're told that Paracelsus is studying the creation of artificially made beings, or homunculus in this case, and he even taught Iska for a while and said he sold his notes regarding the creation of one. I'm only bringing that up because force foreshadowing. So now we have to rescue our friends by finding them two at a time until they snap out of evil possession or whatever. Then everyone splits off into four teams to stop the forces of the Roman Empire by firing through the same areas for the millionth time and the same bosses, and if you die at the redo bosses, you have to do the whole stage again. I'm getting really sick of this game dragging on like this, I just want to finish it already! Everyone gets new weapons, Siegfried fights Shadow versus of himself and discovers what he did to his father, which will be no surprise to those that actually know Siegfried's backstory in these games. He seals Soul Edge away and gets a new sword that we passed by several times before and fights Nightmare with it, which by the way is the sword Siegfried uses on the cover, but doesn't use it till near the end of the game. After a long and unnecessary sequence of missions involving the battlefields we've already played through a half a dozen times, we finally confront the Emperor and take care of her. Our people. Our people. Eliminate. 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 Oh. 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 Okay. Wait. Was she homunculus? Like the ones Iska and Paracelsus mentioned trying to do? And since it looks like Iska's sister... Oh no, don't tell me! Yes, it turns out Iska was planning to take both swords the entire time. He made an elaborate plan to use a fully functional false human under his will as an emperor and use Siegfried and the others to restore Soul Edge and get Soul Calibur from Barbaros that destroyed his homeland. The only reason, the only reason he wants both swords is to be powerful so he can make up for not being able to save his fucking sister. Worst plot twist villain ever! Naturally, he's the final boss and is annoying, especially with the projectiles that you need to hit back with specific attacks depending on how they're thrown, and with the loose controls it didn't work half the time. Not to mention lasers of doom that you need to dodge with the stilted jumping. But eventually he dies and Siegfried takes Soul Edge so he could become Nightmare and Soul Calibur anyway. The only thing I'm glad at is that this is now over. There is, however, an after-game chapter where selecting Eska explains his overly complicated plan and you'll be able to replay all the stages with everyone. You even unlock... <gasps> an alternate color costume for all the characters! <laughs> yeah, the only point of this Game Plus mode is to continue to grind and rank up and get the last weapons for everyone, but I'm sure as hell not embarking on even more tedium than I have to. It took me 9 hours to beat the 6th chapter campaign, which may not seem that long, but it drags on pretty badly near the end to make it feel even longer. Oh, but there is still the multiplayer if, for whatever reason, you and a friend want to play this instead of the actual Soul Calibur games. There is modes where you play stages cooperatively, competitively to collect the most things, and you thought Banjo-Kazooie was a literal collect-a-thon, defeat the most enemies, and a dual mode where whoever can stunlock the other long enough wins. There's no online functionality whatsoever, but that's for the best since this would most likely end up a ghost town like Castlevania Judgments online. You also unlock new stages for multiplayer with each completed single-player chapter, but I doubt you and the person you forced to play this with will even bother with all the multiplayer stages. In case you couldn't tell, I didn't like this game very much. The combat is mundane and haphazard, the level design is more cut and paste than the Halo game, and you replay stages way too much throughout the game. If you're a fan of any of the Soul Calibur games, I would not recommend it even for the in-between the first two games story. It's nothing special, it has a dumb revelation at the end, and is not even part of the overall series canon. It's pretty clear that this was just a spin-off thrown out there by the developers, and that more effort went to Soul Calibur 4 that came out the following year. Hell, even 5 with its story mode and new characters no one liked much is still a much better game proving that Project Souls should just stick with its core fighting games, and thankfully they did. If you just want a hack and slash game for the Wii, I still wouldn't recommend it. It's monotonous and has virtually no good replay value. At most, it's a really cheap bargain bin pickup or a rental, but other than that, it's not worth it. This game is not very fun. <laughs> this is dull. Well, that game was a bust. Looks like you can join the ranks of games like Mortal Kombat Sub-Zero Mythologies for fighting game spin-offs no one in the right mind wants to play. Now then... Hopefully the next game that was voted for will be at least a little better. And it's going to be... Layer! Goody.